my dear brothers and sisters, there's something unique about the gospel according to Luke. And the fact is that we have in the Bible not only the gospel according to Luke, but we have also a second work from Luke, which is, of course, the Acts of the Apostles. And it is so interesting to see the relationship between these two works by Luke. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I fancy that Luke's two books in the Bible might share a common title. We might call his gospel the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. Because as you probably know, this is the gospel that insists more constantly, more, uh, more often on the action of the Holy Spirit. You remember that in the Annunciation, it is presented the Holy Spirit and the shadow of the Holy Spirit over the Blessed Virgin. And you remember as well that when the child Jesus, baby Jesus, is uh, carried to the temple in Jerusalem, then it is the Holy Spirit that is gathering people like Simeon or Anna. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. And this is interesting because their role, the action of the Holy Spirit is very, very um, powerful and very frequent in the Gospel according to Luke. It is also Luke who says that it was the Spirit that moved, that pushed Jesus to the wilderness after the baptism. And also he speaks of the gift of the Spirit um, anointing Jesus and then making Jesus rejoice, rejoice when he says, I I thank you, Father, because you have revealed these things to the little ones and you have hidden these things. You have hid these things from the learned and the, and the so smart people of the world. So the insistence in the action of the Holy Spirit is one of the clear marks of the Gospel according to Luke. And that is why I, I dare to propose to call the Gospel according to Luke the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. Probably it is good to remember as well that the word Christ comes from the Greek Christos. Christos in the Greek language means anointed, the anointed one. So that the very name of our Lord is, um, is a reference to the action and the presence and the anointment of the Holy Spirit. Well, this related to the gospel. But then if you go to the second work by St. Luke, the Acts of the Apostles, you know, we might call this book, the work of the Holy Spirit in the disciples of Jesus Christ. Have you noticed, I'm sure you have, have you noticed that in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, there is no single, there is no single main character. At the very beginning, we have this conversation between Jesus and the disciples, then the ascension of the Lord, then Pentecost, then we have the cycle of Peter. Then we have some tales about Philip the deacon. And then we have the missionary travels of the Apostle St. Paul. So there's no human main character. There's no human main character. But the main character, yes, there is one. And it is the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's correct. So. We might call <clears throat> these two books, we might call them the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ 
and the work of the Holy Spirit in the disciples of Jesus Christ. Which, which <clears throat> is, a, is a great <clears throat> teaching, at least for me, because this shows the powerful unit in the work of Luke. The work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, and then the work of the Holy Spirit in the disciples of Jesus Christ. And you know what's the great thing of the book of the Acts of the Apostles? This book has 28 chapters, 28. And if you go to the very end of this work, you realize that it is a very strange ending. It's a very strange way of ending the work. Because you see that it's telling us about the labors and the difficulties and the efforts of the Apostle St. Paul. And now he is in Rome, uh, well, and he is incarcerated for the second time at least. He's incarcerated, he's in prison. And being in prison, he is free to preach the gospel to some of the Jews and the Christians that there are in Rome. And that's the end of it. So it's, it's very strange, if you think of it. It's, it's very strange because you think, well, what's the end of this book? What's the proper closing of this book? And the answer is that the book doesn't end. The book doesn't end. We, we are the people of God. We are the disciples of Christ. We, we all, we believers, we are the continuation of the Acts of the Apostles. So the book has an open end in the sense that each one of us can, can pick up that point in the history of salvation, in the history of the spreading of the gospel, and you can say, I am the continuation of this beautiful story. I am the continuation. And you are my friend. You are my brother. You are the continuation of this beautiful news. This is important. You know, this is important for two reasons. First, because when we realize the strong unit between the gospel and the book of the Acts of the Apostles, we are understanding that the action, the work of the Holy Spirit is open to everyone. It's open to everyone. It's not just for a reserved elite. It's not just for a small group of people. If it is the Holy Spirit, and certainly it is, huh? if it is the Holy Spirit who is doing this wonderful work with so many miracles and powerful preaching and casting of demons and everything, that's also your story. That's also my story. There is no limit. There is no limit whatsoever between that story and your story. There's no reason to doubt it. Which means that if it is the Holy Spirit working through Paul, who was a great sinner, if it is the Holy Spirit who is working through Peter, you remember Peter the Apostle, who denied Christ. If the Holy Spirit is able capable and willing to do such things in that sinners, in those sinners, well, the Holy Spirit can do also something through me. I am a sinner. You are another one. Well, at least you look like one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if the Lord is powerful enough to send the Holy Spirit so as to transform these people in real missionaries, soldiers of the battles of God, he is also able, capable, willing,
to do the same with you. Second, second, the work of the Holy Spirit guarantees the unity in goal and purpose of the whole church. If the Holy Spirit is working through you, through me, through him, through her, through them, and through them, if it is the same Holy Spirit doing his wonderful work in everyone and through everyone, there is unity. Unity in goal and purpose. So the unity of the mission of the church, the unity of the work of the church is truly warranted because there is just but one spirit, just by one spirit working through everyone. You have read that exactly in the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. So it is, it is biblical, it is true. It is great to recognize this role, this particular place that the Holy Spirit has in the books of St. Luke. At the same time, we should remember that in proclaiming the creed, for example, at the Holy Mass, we affirm that we believe in the Holy Spirit and we say the Lord, the giver of, the giver of life. The Lord, the giver of life. He is the Lord, the Holy Spirit. There's no conflict, of course, between Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit the Lord. There's no conflict. It is the same Godhead that is at work in everything that goes beyond the inner life of the Holy Trinity. There's no conflict, of course. I have no need to repeat this. The Holy Spirit is the Lord. So the Holy Spirit is preserving and increasing and building up the unity of the church and the work of the church. And then, the Holy Spirit is the Lord. The Lord means that He is in command and we are to obey. He is the Lord. We are His servants. His loving and loved servants. That's what Define the discipleship of ours. We are his loving and loved servants. Probably it is more logical to say the loved and loving servants of the Holy Spirit. Loved and loving servants of the Holy Spirit. I don't know you, but I really like that, tit that title. Who am I? I am a loved and loving servant of the Holy Spirit. It's great. It's simply great. Because He is the Lord. He is the Lord. So, in saying that, I am professing, professing. Professing what? Professing the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. And I am professing, of course, my obedience to the Holy Spirit. Well, Secondly, we say in the creed of the Mass, we say he is the giver of life, which means that no spirit, no life. <laughs> Simple. He is the giver, no spirit, no life. The Holy Spirit is not an ornament. It's not an ornament in the church. It is the very strength, it is the very soul, it is the very power, it is the very life of the whole church. Nothing, please pay attention, nothing, nothing that is living in the church of God receives life from any other source. It is only the Spirit. So if sacraments are to do what they, what they are meant to do, it is 
because of the Spirit, if the Holy Eucharist is giving you the life of Christ, if you can truly call the Eucharist the bread of life, it is because of the Holy Spirit. If you receive the absolution in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and you are truly pardoned, and your sins are destroyed, destroyed, this is the Lamb of God who takes away, who takes away, who takes away the sins of the world. If your sins are taken away, it is because there is power of the Holy Spirit working in you. And that happens only through the action, through the work, through the life of the Holy Spirit. The absence of the Spirit can only spell anarchy. Because there would not be a true leader. The absence of the Holy Spirit would only spell death. Because there would not be true life. Well, you know, the first generation of Christians, they were very much aware of all this. Probably some of these sentences might ring new in some ears, maybe. But for the first generations of Christians, all what I am telling you here was the very basics of Christian faith. They were completely convinced of this. The first generation of Christians, they were very much aware of all these facts. We read in the Acts of the Apostles that the missionaries were asking the Lord with fervent prayers where they should turn to. Where? What's the next step? Let's ask the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. A good, a good part of the Acts of the Apostles is uh, the, all the traveling of the Apostle St. Paul, of course. Do you remember where and when all that started over? You remember that? It was in Antioch, and they were fasting, and they were praying, and at some point there was prophecy, charism. There was prophecy. Hey, separate for me, separate for me, Barnaba and Paul. I have something for them. It was a prophecy. So people were amazed, and what? Did they do? They fasted again and they prayed even more fervently. They prayed again over that and they asked the Lord with all their hearts, what do you want from us? What do you want from Paul and Barnaba? And a second action of the Spirit, second prophecy, and they were sent to preach the gospel across the world. So who, we, who was in command? The Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that said, this and this for me, and this and this, Paul and Barnabas, go there. If it all started that way, that was also the way it continued. It was exactly that way. At every step, they were praying, what's the next step? What's the next step? What should we do now? What comes next? If this reminds you of Abraham, you're on the right path. It's exactly the same. You remember the words that the Lord said to Abraham? He said to Abraham, go, but the Lord didn't tell Abraham where to. 
Step by step, Abraham. Obedient. Obedient, Abraham. Obedient every day. Every day. Obedient, Abraham. So this day, I listen to the Lord, and tomorrow, I listen to the, to the Lord, and the day after tomorrow, I listen to the Lord, <laughs> and the day after the day after tomorrow, I listen to the Lord. That's the way. So Christian life can be defined by obedience. I am completely sure this is not the most popular word around. In particular, at this time, obedience has a very bad name. Because, as we said yesterday, at our time, self-invention, self-invention rules the world. Self-invention means, now I want to be this, uh, but now I want to be this, and now I want to be this. And we think that it is our wish, our desire, our project, our thoughts that are to be realized. The Bible has a very different idea. Christian life is defined by listening and by obedience. Now, and what's the great reason for being obedient to the Lord? The great reason is, He has loved me. <laughs> he has loved me in such a way, in such a way, that nobody could love me at that level, in such a way, with such depth. Never, ever. That's the reason for obedience. Let me share with you a passage from chapter 20. Chapter 20 from the books, from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. This is Paul. This is Paul um, summoned, summoning the elders of the community, the Christian community of Ephesus. From Miletus, this is chapter 20, Acts of the Apostles. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, I will read along and please pay attention to the action of the Holy Spirit and the way this particular missionary is so attentive to the work and the word and the wish of the Holy Spirit. When they arrived, when the elders of the church of Ephesus arrived, Paul said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. This is a great summary, a great summary of everything that he was doing up to that point. But he continues. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. Oh, this is so sweet in my ears. Compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race 
and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. How great, how great. This is chapter 20, book of the Acts of the Apostle. Let's underline a few verses. The attitude, the method, and the contents. The attitude. Paul says, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing. This is the inner, the inner preparation, the inner training that has made of him what he is. This is, this is the, the structure, the inner structure of an apostle. Serving the Lord with great humility, with tears, with tears, and in the midst of severe testing. Please pay attention to the fact that there is something to the inside and there is something to the outside. To the inside, humility and tears. To the outside, severe testing. That's the training of an apostle. That's the training. And I only think of myself. Where am I as compared to this great apostle? Great humility, tears, and severe testing. That's the way. That's the way. And this is the, the attitude, so to speak. And then, the method. I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. The big criterion for St. Paul is exactly this word. To preach what is helpful to you. We will come back to this after a little while. What is helpful to you? This is the criterion, at least one of the criteria, to be helpful to you. What is helpful for the people? So my main interest cannot be how do I feel, what I am making from this, what's the profit for me, are people accepting and praising me, uh, am I becoming famous? No, that's no criterion. The criterion is what is helpful for the people. What is of real aid for the people so that they receive something that really, really builds up the community. That's the criterion. And that's the method. So now we have the training. The training is humility, Interior humility, exterior testing. Humility, testing. Humility, testing. And then the method is center. Center yourself, focus yourself in what is helpful for the people. Which is an act of love, if you think of that. And then the contents. What's the contents of the preaching? I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
How can we recognize a true apostle? Because of the attitude, the method, and the contents. The attitude is he or she a truly humble person? Has he been tested through suffering, through exclusion, through persecution, through solitude, loneliness, I mean? Has he been tested? Yes, he has. Yes, she has. And what was the outcome? Very good outcome. This person is faithful. This person is perseverant. Okay. Attitude, correct. Method. Method. What is her emphasis in her preaching? What is his emphasis in his ministry? What is? Well, the main criterion all the time that he has is to be helpful to the people. What builds up the community? What is good for the community? What is making good to others? Through charity, through love. And then, the contents. Is he inviting people to repentance? Is he inviting people to put absolute and complete trust and faith in Jesus Christ? Yes. Okay. So attitude is correct. The method is correct. And the contents is correct. We are before the true apostle. That's the testing. That's the way. This means obedience to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you see that the attitude is correct and the method is correct, but then the contents is doubtful. And this is happening nowadays, may I say. This is happening nowadays. Now we have some preachers, some preachers I will, nom I will not name anyone, but we have preachers that are kind of caressing, caressing the ears of people. They have very sweet and encouraging words, but they are not inviting people to repentance. Repentance is of the essence of the gospel. Yes, you have to be merciful. You have to be kind. You have to be, yes, friendly. You have to be friendly and kind and merciful. But if your mercy, if your kindness is not on the way of repentance, at some point, excuse me, you lost the way. You lost the way. You have to be inviting people to repentance, everyone. And whoever, whoever is, selling, is saying to you, whoever is saying to you, it's not necessary that you repent from this sin. That person does not come from God. It comes, he comes or she comes from a very different person place and is not heaven is not heaven he is not coming from the gospel of Jesus Christ he is not coming from the sending of the Holy Spirit he is not coming from the church he is not coming from heaven he is a missionary or she is a missionary but a missionary of something horrible and dark that's not from God. Repentance is of the essence of the gospel. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. But if you are preaching the importance of repentance and the seriousness of sin, but you are not inviting people to put their trust, their faith in God, in Jesus Christ, who is the revelation, the full revelation of God's love, Oh no, oh no, that's not the gospel either. That's not the gospel either. So the seal, the seal of the gospel is powerful invitation to repentance and even more powerful invitation to trust in the mercy of God. That's the seal of the Holy Spirit. I repeat myself, powerful invitation to repentance, 
People that are saying, oh no, it is not necessary. You can continue. You can continue in sin. Continue sinning. Continue. Oh my. Who is saying that to you? Who is saying that? Continue, continue, continue sinning, continue. <laughs> Who is saying that to you? Continue, 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 continue sinning, sinning forever. <laughs> Who is saying that to you? He doesn't come from heaven. He doesn't come from God. Repentance is of the essence. Last time I said, repentance is of the essence of the gospel. But if you have a powerful preaching inviting to repentance, you have the duty of having an even more powerful preaching about mercy. Everything Paul has done comes as a fruit of the Spirit. Remember the verbs. The Spirit compels Paul. What a powerful verb. Compels. It's like, like pushing, like pushing. Compels Paul. I was compelled to go to Jerusalem. This particular verse tells us something. Paul was a great character. He has a very, very strong will. He was a man of conviction and principles, but he was able to be obedient. So to be obedient is not because you are so weak, you are so fearful, you are so insecure that if they say to you, to the left, oh yes, 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 <laughs> to the right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a Christian. That's not a disciple of Jesus Christ. You have your own strong personality. You have your own character. You're strong and that's good. But as strong as you are, you have to be even more obedient. Even more obedient. That's the seal of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. You remain faithful. It is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of true, true strength. True strength. Because true strength cannot be anarchy. True strength cannot be doing your will every time. So the Spirit compels Paul. This is, this is great. The Spirit compels Paul. Wow. How can this happen? The Spirit compels Paul. And then the Spirit warns him. He's telling Paul in advance, be ready, be ready, my friend, because if now it is difficult, tomorrow will be more difficult. The Spirit is not deceiving us. The Spirit is not making us false promises. That's completely alien from the Spirit. The Spirit is so real, so trustful. The Spirit will tell you, situation is bad. When the situation is bad, the Spirit will not say to you, oh, don't worry. The Spirit was telling Paul, situation is bad, but I have something to tell you. Situation will become worse. <laughs> well, well, probably it's not. It's not the most encouraging message. But at the same time, the same Spirit that is telling you, situation is bad and situation will become worse, the same Spirit is telling you, and you know what? I will be with you. You're not alone. Amen. You have a great fight before you, but you are not fighting by yourself. I will be with you. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. 
acting in you and through you. Well, I would like to finish this meditation. I would like to finish just with a short consideration of that verb that you have noticed is so, <laughs> so impressive for me. The Holy Spirit compels Paul. It's like making an obligation. It is like forcing Paul's will. The Spirit compels, compelled me to go to Jerusalem. How is it? How is it in simple terms? How is it that the Spirit compels Paul or compels any of us? How does it happen? How does it happen? I have my own mind. I have my own reasoning. I see things happening. I have my own projects, my own way of seeing things and trying to deal with them. And then the Spirit comes and says to me, no, it's not that way, it is a different way. How does this happen? That is the question. Well, probably we don't have a full answer, but we have some hints in the scripture. And the main hint was already read for you. You remember the word helpful? Helpful. Paul says, I have said everything that could be helpful for you. So clearly, that criterion, that criterion about loving your neighbor in the sense of looking for is for that which is better, which is best for your neighbor, that's a powerful light which is leading the way. And we have another criterion to be faithful to the doctrine. And we have another criterion, the greater glory of God. And for today, we will stop there. Three criteria, three. In order of importance, first one, looking for the greater glory of God. Second, being faithful to the gospel, to the doctrine, to the truth that was worth the blood of the Son of God. When we speak in the Catholic Church, when we speak of doctrine, we are speaking not of a set of ideas. Yes, this is important. When we speak of doctrine in the Church, we are not speaking of a set of ideas. This is not like saying to you, have you heard of the theorem of Pythagoras? Yes, I do. I have. Okay, be ready to die for the theorem of Pythagoras. No, no, it's not. He's not dying for an idea. Doctrine is not a set of ideas. It's not some sort of a scaffolding, abstract scaffolding to the side of the building of the church. When we speak of doctrine, we speak of the revelation of the true God, which has happened because of Christ's death on the cross, by the shedding of his blood. By the shedding of his blood. So doctrine means the revelation of the true God and the revelation of truth, of the truth of man, of the truth of humankind, through the shedding of the blood of Christ. That's doctrine. Doctrine is not just a set of ideas. Because some people nowadays, they speak of theology like different schools of thought. So you have your ideas. Okay, that, that's okay. 
But I also know another theologian that has a different set of ideas. And even, I know even another one that has another set of ideas. No, we are not speaking of sets of ideas. We're speaking of the revelation of the true God and the revelation of the true drama, the true drama of humankind that was revealed by the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what we are speaking about when we speak of doctrine. So three criteria to look how to obey the Holy Spirit. First, looking, seeking the greater glory of God. Second, being faithful to the doctrine, understood in the terms that I have already explained. And third, third, look, look, for what is good for your neighbor, what is helpful for your neighbor. And how is helpful understood in this case? Helpful means what builds up the community. First letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 14. What is building up the community? Three criteria to look for the voice of the Spirit and the direction that the Spirit is willing me to take. Three signs, three criteria. Please, look for the greater glory of God. Purify, purify yourself, purify your conscience, purify your mind, purify your heart, so as to be sure that as far as you are concerned, you are really looking for the greater glory of God. Second, be faithful, be faithful to the doctrine. Do not, do not change the doctrine trying to please people. Do not change the gospel, do not change the doctrine just trying to please people. Do not do that. Please, don't do that to Christ, don't do that. It's not worth, it's not worth doing. So, second, be faithful to the doctrine. And third, third, look for what is helpful to your neighbor. How do I understand, how do we understand being helpful to the neighbor? What builds up the community? With this criteria, sometimes you find, ah, I don't like to do this. I don't want, I don't want to do it. But I have to, but I have to. Because, you see, the greater glory of God, faithfulness to the doctrine, and being helpful to my neighbor, points in that direction. And that direction is my Jerusalem. Paul had his Jerusalem. Probably you have yours. <laughs> you have your, your Jerusalem. And what is Paul's Jerusalem? Paul's Jerusalem is, well, actually the city of Jerusalem where he was heading to. And that was the place when he was persecuted and when he was incarcerated. And well, it was horrible, horrible. That was his Jerusalem. But each one of us, at some point in our life, at some point, we will find our own Jerusalem. And probably your Jerusalem is the final part of your life. Or probably your Jerusalem is going to some group or people that are not willing to receive you gladly and thankfully. Probably they are to oppose you, but they are your Jerusalem. And if you follow these three criteria, and following them, you see, well, everything is pointing in that direction. My friend, the same Holy Spirit that anointed Paul will be with you, will be with you. And if the Holy Spirit, the strength and force of God is with you, I am absolutely sure, absolutely sure, Victory is yours because victory is Christ's.
Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.